Uh, I've just been to a conference arranged by Robin Daly, who runs Yes to Life. Um, Robin Daly is a most amazing man who uh, has obviously had a life change. Uh, and I'd like to really ask him about how that came about. Is that going to be too painful for you, Robin? Not at all, no. Uh, I know I've read read the story of Brian, isn't it? Yeah, yes. Oh, that's so true. that's. Mm. Would you like to? Yeah, share sure. a little bit of that. Yeah, um, yeah. My daughter Brian was diagnosed with a very rare kind of cancer, age nine. Uh, obviously, a massive shock to us at the time, um, and uh, she underwent. All everything that orthodox medicine had to throw at her at the time, um, she uh, she got through the initial round of treatment and was given the all clear. In fact, the the initial cancer she had never reoccurred. It did actually work the treatment for that. Mm. Unfortunately, the orthodox medicine uh, she was given included a lot of radiotherapy, and uh, this gave her cancer a new kind of cancer. Um, this then had to be treated uh, and included amputating her leg, which is where the, all the treatment had been. This was uh, about three years later, 12, 13, and um, uh, another round of treatment. Anyway, she, that, was, that seemed to be it for then, and we got ahead with life. She had a great time, actually, during her teenage years. Yes, she, I read her story. Yeah, you, she you really did the most wonderful things mm, together. Uh, yeah, and she really family. valued her. Her life at that point she kind of she psychologically came back from the dead at a certain point during her treatment she she's given up on life at, at one point because it was so bad the treatment she went through but she did a kind of turnaround and came decided to come back again with a vengeance and actually lived life very much to the full all through her teenage years and uh, but unfortunately with the uh, radiotherapy the effects linger on forever and uh, she got another bone tumour from radiotherapy when she was in her early 20s um, and uh, <clears throat> at that time uh, it was it was quite unlikely that orthodox medicine was going to be able to help her in any way um, when she was younger we'd always done everything we could as well as orthodox medicine um, but at that time there was no internet there's no mobile phones, you know. We we just found out what we could at the time, and it wasn't that much. But whatever it was, we did it. Yeah. This time, when she was in her early twenties, the internet had arrived, and you could put in uh, alternative cancer treatment and get back a few million results. And uh, we started off down this route of finding out if there's anything else we could do to help her. And uh, several things became very obvious very quickly. Uh, first of all, that the, the the, we've gone from not very much information to far too much information of utterly variable quality. Some of it uh, might be something that could save your life. Other stuff uh, is just uh, a hoax, a complete rip-off. Yeah, yeah. And um, the only way to find your way through this was to literally go through website after website after website, trawling through lists of treatments. Have we seen this one before? Yeah, we've done that one. This one here, never heard of this. What's this? what does it treat, where do you get it, how much does it cost, does it work, is it a hoax? You have to go through all these questions with every single thing you find and then even amongst the things you find you then have to try and decide well is this more important than this? Uh, we've only got this much money, should we spend, what should we spend it on? Uh, and we had, you'd have to find people to supervise any of this treatment as well. It was just an absolute minefield, you know. Uh, uh, on top of that, of course, anything outside the NHS is private medicine, and uh, so we realised very quickly there's going to be an enormous amount of money needed. So, uh, anyway, we addressed these things as best we could with Brian, which meant we actually got a lot of money together through doing an appeal, and we did a lot of research and found out some potential ways to help her. Um, in the event, she actually died very suddenly. We barely begun to help her and uh, she died so um, we were left with the money and we already had the intention while she was still alive to actually do something about the situation on behalf of yeah. other people I've, I've, I've spoken to so many people who've, who've been nutritionists or doctors uh, and a, a kind of a disaster is what has changed their life and yeah. obviously that's a real disaster for you yeah. but what a legacy yeah, months, yeah. what a legacy she's left absolutely yeah I mean it was uh, it was a 
a, a complete turnaround for my, myself personally. Um, if you like, I'd spent uh, or a, a lot of years before trying to sort of engineer a change in my life which would completely reprioritize the things for myself, you know, where I put the things that were most important to myself at the top of the list and live in, live in that kind of way. And I'd made little attempts and then it had fallen back and I just, you know, it hadn't happened. Anyway, this was a kind of do or die moment uh, after Brownie died. I thought, right, that's it, I'm not going back. And um, I just set off down a route which I felt that the time that I'd had with her during all her treatment and everything had been a time when I'd personally been very much in touch with what was most important to me. That's what happens when you're around you know, people who are in, in danger of dying. That you love. That you love. You wake up pretty quick. And, uh, yeah, we all focus pretty quickly when those circumstances happen. So I thought, well, uh, what's the thing that's going to keep me focused? Well, I'm just going to stay right on this. I'm not going to let it go. And so rather than trying to kind of forget about the whole thing, I've had my head <laughs> in a bucket full of stuff to do with cancer <laughs> ever since, you know. Right. And what it's done is it's meant I've been in touch with all sorts of incredible people over the years who've been doing incredible things. And, um, yeah, it's had that effect for me. It's, uh, I mean, personally, I, in a funny kind of way, <clears throat> you know, charity is all about doing stuff for other people, but I feel like actually primarily I'm doing it for myself. It's to actually to keep me in the right place. So you're, you're healing yourself I'm as living, well. I'm living the life. I, I feel I, I want to live, yeah. yeah. You're contributing. Yeah, so... Um, I can't remember, actually, how I heard of you first. I probably was trawling the net for something. Mm, maybe, yeah. And uh, I came yeah. to a couple of your conferences, mm. and then I was at the one with, where, where you attempted to... Well, you, you have started the Integrated Oncology Society. Yeah. I mean, well, that, that was an amazing conference for me. Yeah. I, I was really happy about that. I mean, basically, this is one of the things that was very obvious to me, uh, is that in this country, all we have, the best we ha have had, is individual practitioners, some of them doing some fantastic work, but they, each of them is doing it entirely unsupported, on their own, fighting their own battles, um, and none of them had ever been talking to each other, sharing their knowledge, experience, making progress together. It just seemed like a crazy situation in a way because there's so little available in this country uh, and yet it's so frail, you know, there's literally nothing of substance there. So uh, in the past I found there were, uh, you know, many years back I think there was, they were quite standoffish actually, practitioners with each other. They'd quite often be uh, pumping themselves up by doing others down, that kind of thing. They used to go on, they used to slag each other off. That whole sort of uh, uh, ethos seems to have died away a lot in the last 10 years, I think. And there's now much more a spirit of, right, OK, things really could change here and we need to work together. I mean, it feels like everybody's got it mm. about that one. And so, yeah, we needed a forum for it. And so uh, came up with this uh, name, uh, the British Society for Integrative Oncology, got on the net and found out there already was a Society for Integrative Oncology uh, in America, been going for a decade. And uh, so we thought, right, well, there's the model for it. I mean, and look at the successes they've been having over there with it as well. They are literally 10 years ahead of us in terms of what's going on in oncology and bringing in a range of approaches. So, um, so yeah, it started. We've got uh, uh, quite a decent number of members now, and I hope it will go on to become a real force for change in yes. this country. Well, uh, are you finding any oncologists that are becoming more interested? Because, I mean, that's going to be the hard nut to crack. It is, it? it is. There are very few, unfortunately. I think, I, I definitely think there's more open-mindedness than there used to be. Yes. And um, I think, uh, I mean... The thing that's notable in Britain is that whereas the, the establishment, so to speak, uh, by which I would mean uh, or doctors, medicine and the government, don't think particularly in this way. They don't place a great emphasis on the benefits of complementary and alternative medicine, for example. Or in, even individual choice. Or even, Well, no, the government uh, say they're trying to push towards individual choice. I think the health service is... Re uh, it resists change, full stop. Uh, it's a huge monolithic beast. 
It's incredibly difficult to change it. Uh, but the government, to give it its due, successive governments have been trying to introduce choice and patient-centred care for 40 years. Uh, the evidence of it is uh, very little, unfortunately, so far. But I have hopes that actually, you know, over time things are actually changing slowly, slowly. Mm-hmm. And as much as anything, when you start to look at periods like 40 years, we're talking about a generational change is happening. So I literally think that uh, there is a new generation of doctors who are more open-minded, who are less inclined to think that they have all the answers that are worth looking at, and that uh, maybe there isn't you know, something going on in another country which is actually well worth our in- uh, interest looking at it. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, what I tend to think at the moment, we've, we've, we've spent billions and billions and billions of pounds on cancer research, mm. and actually what's happening is more and more people are getting cancer. They're now mm. saying that one in three people you yeah. know, we're, we're, we're going to be touched by it. Yeah. So you could take the view that all of that has been money thrown down the drain. Um, in one way, um, yes. Really I mean, what we need to do is prevention. Prevention is what we need to do. I mean, obviously for people who've got cancer, they want answers. Of course, uh, and of so course. There's, always, you know, there's always a place for finding the best ways to treat cancer in people who've got it. But... Uh, yeah, much more important, you're right, that the incidence of cancer is going up. You know, they, they're telling you the good news that more people are living for longer with cancer and this kind of thing, which, okay, that's good. But the fact that the number of people getting cancer is going up, is the, is, that's, the, that's the bad news. It's bad news. It's terrible. And so nobody, you're right, is looking at that. Cancer Research UK spends virtually nothing on research into prevention. Why? It's just, it's literally not on the agenda. There's, uh, it's not a good well, enough. Well, because it's going to interfere with the food industry. Well, it'll interfere with the food industry, the pharmaceutical industry, whatever. You know, it's, it, it's, uh, it's a change, basically, in the status quo. If, if they start to find out, uh, you know, that the things we're doing now and that are a good business model are not a good model for health. <laughs> That's fairly succinctly put, I think, yeah. isn't it? Uh, so... Yeah, but I'm optimistic. I think the good thing that's happening now is I've given you this picture of, of where um, the establishment is at, is yeah, resistant to change, is the, is the picture, basically. Uh, but the public is way, way ahead of that, I think. And, uh, you know, the public in Britain are spending out enormous amounts of money on complementary alternative medicine, they are. They are even though they've got a free health service. Yes. Uh, so why? Well, it's quite obvious that complementary alternative medicine is producing results in some areas of healthcare that they're not getting at their free NHS. And it, the way it seems to me is it's very neatly divided is that there the, the are two kinds of uh, health problem. One is the acute one and one is the chronic one. And uh, the NHS is fantastic at acute medicine, seems to me. Really good. You know, if you've got That's a heart surgery, attack, yeah. you know, uh, they're bloody brilliant. But... Anything chronic, virtually anything chronic, uh, really... They're not curing. No, no, they just give you things that uh, keep it at bay, at Mm. best. And usually, at the same time, you get a few other side effects, which are not very nice. So, really, no cures for chronic illness. And generally, this chronic illness is to do with the food that we eat. Uh, Well, I think think that's certainly a massive part of it, is the food that we eat. Um, It's a lot of other things, too, but... uh, uh, if you're going to find one big, biggest single culprit, I would agree. I think food is food, yeah. is the one. And sh- sugar within that, and of course the part I'm interested in is the fats which get abused. Mm. Well, I think we're, what what we're getting with with uh, processed foods, and in fact all foods that aren't organic and you know they're not made by a company that's actually deliberately trying to produce very wholesome food, is that. Everyone's being hit with a double whammy. What what you we're getting is we're getting food and the, uh, from the rest of our environment as well. But we're getting toxins basically at a rate alarming rate we've never had before, and they're uh, they're coming actually directly in our food, but uh, they're also coming from all sorts of other parts of our life. Um, uh, toxins, obviously, if you can reduce them, great. But actually, you can't reduce them that much. Uh, you know, there's many things you can't do much about in your life now. No. That's why I, I think, you know, making flexible and resistant cells 
uh, who, exactly. who we've always been able to get rid of all sorts of toxins yeah. because all sorts of plants already have, you know, in the, in the wild have, That's right. have toxins on them to protect themselves. Exactly. So toxins are part of life. Yeah. It just happens that we've turned up the volume fantastically with the toxins. And it's, turned down the food volume. Exactly. Ourselves. Simultaneously, we're yeah. being fed stuff that's it's almost completely unnutritious, if that's a word. And so we've got no reserves to actually deal with the increasing toxin load. So the fact that we're getting sick is like, well, it's not surprising. No, no. I, I had a chat with a lovely um, nutritional doctor called Brian McDonough. Mm -hmm. And I started off with Hippocrates. And I said, um, you know, he said, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. I said, are we there yet? And he, he then said, well, Hippocrates was would be struck off the medical register today mm -hmm. um, but he was a teacher uh, and it's actually a, what it is about curing people is listening to people mm -hmm. and doctors apparently have got less time to do that nowadays yeah well they, they yeah they don't have the time for it that's right and that of course is one of the massive offerings of complementary alternative medicine is they actually do generally give the time and they do listen um, but uh, but also I feel that the, the doctors themselves are in a terrible bind at the moment because I think they're increasingly true. getting shoved into a corner where they're not allowed to give much time to the patient and all they can do to, to help the patient is what their computer screen tells them to do. Uh, anything else, they're yeah. kind of being unethical or something. They're not allowed to respond to individuals anymore. They're only allowed to give a blanket response to yeah. all the individuals who fit this, complete, uh, this category. And, you know, that doesn't even work as an idea. That's no, and I think this is building up in doctors huge, huge problems because I think a lot of them actually know this mm -hmm. and I think they're probably frightened, scared, you know, there's all sorts of yeah. emotions. I don't think they know what to do with it, I agree. But then no. they're basically having their skill as clinicians taken away from them and replaced with a computer. Eventually, you won't need them there. You just walk in, have a quick scan, and the computer will tell you what to add. Yeah, because, I mean, uh, you used to go to the doctor and used to say, stick your tongue out. He looked at your tongue, he looked at your hair, yeah. looked at your eyes, and these are all indicators of what's yeah. going on inside. And they seem to have, you know, as you say, they, they've stopped being doctors. Yeah, it feels like that. And, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, I mean, you can, uh, somebody get, uh, told me the, the parallel uh, sort of situation to this would be something like if you uh, went round Britain and you measured everybody's shoe size and you took at the average and you said, right, okay, it's eight and a half. And you're going to issue everybody with size eight and a half shoes. <laughs> some people do quite well, you know. Some do really well, in fact. And a few people do get by, uh, but some people would just like completely miss the mark. It'd be absolutely useless that approach. So you get lots of broken legs and arms with people falling <laughs> over. Well, true, you would. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, mm. it's amazing. So, um, what's the, what's the next the next steps, um, Robin? You, uh, obviously. Tell me a little bit more about Yes to Life. Yes to Life. Okay. So we're, we're doing two things. One, one of them is we, we're offering direct support to people with cancer. So um, we want to help them to find out all the ways in which they want to help themselves. In so you're, you're a site where instead of having to trawl all the net, yes. you've done a lot of that. And you've the, brought the things yeah. together that really do yeah. make sense. So this is the, answering my own problem that I had of trying to find out uh, you know, who can I trust? Who's going to give reliable information? They need a shortcut to this ridiculous process of trying to find uh, the right people and the right approaches that will help them. So, uh, yes, life that's its sole purpose. It's a charity. It's not there to make money out of them. It's only there to be helpful. So we're there to point them towards a reliable sources of information so they can then make up their mind what they think is the best thing to do at this point. Um, so we're also helping some of those people financially a bit because uh, this is all paid for medicine, all the, all the stuff that falls outside of the NHS. So that's on the one side, direct support for people with cancer. And uh, that, that kind of information and everything can be enormously helpful to people and sort of pointing them in the right direction. Uh, Bundled up with that, we're also being actually incredibly supportive of people who want to, who have got the guts to actually start looking outside the box. Uh, something which some of them haven't experienced at all before they call us up. Uh, you know, we, we are very often told, "Oh, you're the first people I've talked to who have had anything positive whatsoever to say about my situation." 
you know that mm. as a psychological burden for somebody to carry is, is, is people shouldn't have to do it no I, f- I find that too now I mean it's obviously people ring me up and they say they are using uh, meal or oil for the part of the Budvig protocol yes. or something like that and uh, you know I, I listen to them and they tell me all sorts of stuff yeah, uh, and and I think talking to people and probably it's they can talk to you is, is yeah. part of healing as well, isn't it? It is. Yeah, you need to find so out you respect... you're not completely nuts. There are other people out there who've, <laughs> yes. uh, you know, know, know that there are uh, there can be success basically. How do you raise your money, Bobby? Uh Pretty much all the public. I mean, we do get a certain amount of uh, grant money and things like that, but in the main it's the public it's the public as I said that like complementary alternative medicine they're the people who support this um, every one person we help knows another ten people get to know about us and what happened yes. and so it's sort of it's organically spread that way and uh, through a mixture of our own sort of public events and people putting on doing sponsored whatever for us that's where most of it comes from so um yeah, so the the other side of what we're doing is just trying to raise awareness because, you know, if you say, or you know, uh, you ask somebody how many approaches to cancer they know about, apart from chemotherapy and radiotherapy and surgery, most people wouldn't have much to say. They, they might not think there were any, or if they were maybe very involved with complementary medicine, they might know one or two they'd heard of. Mm-hmm. But literally, there are a vast range of things you can do, um, and people are largely uninformed about this. It, the whole thing's under the radar, yeah. and um, so we're just by having an educational program of seminars like the one we just met at, and uh, workshops and conferences, we're aiming to just raise everybody's awareness of the fact that actually there's much more choice than you might imagine. Yeah, I know what what of the people that speak to me. You know, when when they ring up, so many of them said, "Oh, I spoke to my oncologist, and I said to them, what kind of diet should I follow? Is diet diet important?'" And uh, in, invariably, they say, oh, "It doesn't matter what you eat." Exactly. Well, we, most people who call us tell us that their oncologist told them it doesn't matter what they eat. I mean, there's, this is completely contrary to the evidence, uh, and of course, it doesn't even make sense. You know, <laughs> so the the public are quick to work out that you know it, do, it really doesn't matter what they eat actually, and uh, and so they go looking for this stuff anyway, despite the the advice they've had. So um, maybe that actually that it doesn't matter what you eat actually triggers something in a I lot think of people it does, to say, I, "Hang on, this can't be right." It can't be right. Well, it isn't right. It's you know the science all says otherwise. Um, it really doesn't, it, you know, they've, they've gone as far as admitting it matters what you eat in order to not get cancer in the first place. Um, it's completely crazy that they say once you've got cancer, oh, it doesn't matter. In fact, we, we actually advise you eat lots of junk food. I mean, that's like petrol on, on a fire, you know. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I remember your, one of your um, uh, members on, on, on a conference I went to, a pro- professor, and he, he was saying, any time you hear the word science-based medicine, when it's to do with um, uh, you know food, the food in the industry, the food side of things, mm-hmm. uh, it, just walk away. <laughs> right. And I thought later on that maybe that's actually we are we are we are um, a stone age chemical factory run by emotions and hormones. And how can you possibly scientifically analyse that? Because we're all different at all sorts of mm. different times. Mm. The public wants to know and they want to be supported in making some good choices for themselves and uh, so that's definitely something we can help with and uh, so more and more people are actually coming to us now which is great. So tell us the website again Robin. Uh, it's yes to life y-e-s-t-o-l-i-f-e dot org dot uk and uh, we, on there you'll find details of our helpline you can call the helpline to speak to someone and uh, yeah, we we hope you find it useful. So, have you uh, do do you spend your whole life doing this now, Rowan, or do you actually uh, have another job to keep yeah, body job. and soul together? Day job. Um, I I did, when I set it up, I had my own business, an IT business. Uh, I sold that three years ago. I'm thankful to say, and it means that I haven't. I don't have to work very much now. I literally do one day a week just to get a bit of pocket money. And uh, so I am actually able to put most, pretty much all my time into charity. Well, that is really inspirational. Uh, well, I love it. I Robin. mean, you know, it's what I love doing. 
you know, so you come into contact with all sorts of people and hear all sorts of I stories. I do, yeah. So yeah. you've given out to the universe. Yeah, I'm, and I have a great life. You have a great life. So you, I, I hope you do something to protect yourself as well, do you? Do you? Uh, no, I don't need to be protected. You don't need to be protected. No. Well, why? What from? I'm, I'm no, no, no. I mean, you, you're giving out all the time. You're giving out all your energy. No, no, I'm getting, I'm getting. I don't, I don't feel like that at all. You're getting. I know, yeah, I'm getting all the time, yeah. Right. And uh, it's had a, a very interesting effect on my perspective on my daughter's death which, of course, is a major tragedy at the time. Um, I now find, like ten years later, there's actually so many good things have come out of that that it's impossible for me now to look back and say it was good or bad. It doesn't, it's, it's kind of neutral in that way. And, and, you know, that's not a nasty thing to say about it or anything. It's just neutral. Uh, because it's just what happened. It's yes, what happened. It's what and, happened. And, and what came out of what happened was... I mean, you know, I can, I can, everything that's happening is so great now yes. that actually, you know, it doesn't mean I don't want my, I wouldn't love to have my daughter back, but yes. life is fantastic. She's there, I think. I think uh, if she is, she's probably enjoying it. Yes. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm often telling people about your story and getting people mm. to go to your site, so I hope they do. I, I probably do. You're yeah. a good salesman, don't we? <laughs> Anyway, Robin, it's really brilliant to uh, yeah, pleasure agree to, talk to, come to you. And, come and come and talk to us, mm. and uh, maybe a little later on we'll have a bit more of a story to talk about if, uh, if we get more. I, I hope so. More oncologists uh, agreeing to think differently, but that's going to be quite a hard nut to crack, I think. Mm. Yeah, but I, mm. I'm sure that uh, you know the cancer nurses as well are actually more supportive, aren't they? Yeah, in some ways. I would say so. I don't yeah. know whether they're quite so constricted, are they, with what they can say? Um, I, I don't know. I think it's a it's a kind of temperamental thing in many ways. They're just more open to yeah. Yeah, but uh, anyway, yeah, I'm very hopeful that things are going to change quicker than we think. Okay. I think we're reaching a kind of tipping point where things will just have to change. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, going, we're going. It's going down an unsustainable route. Everybody knows it. You know, everybody from the government down openly acknowledges we can't go on the way we're going. So in the end. There has to be an openness for change. It's simply force, you know, that's going to bring it in. Uh, you give the driver of the public that she wants this change as well. Well, come on, I think it could happen quite quickly. Just have right. to keep pushing away. I certainly hope you're right there. Yeah. I keep on doing these little broadcasts now, and um, sometimes I get a bit controversial. <laughs> uh, and I hope yeah. uh, that uh, you know things will happen. And, and in fact, the the um, the 2012 Health and Social Care Act does look a little bit more towards prevention yes. and uh, I know, you know, people started way. saying oh hang on this is what we've got to do maybe yeah. they've backed themselves into a little bit of cor corner they yeah. have opened the door there they have I know but, uh, yeah there's even a bit of patient choice around the corner as well oh my god yeah personal health budgets personal health budgets yeah, yeah. okay well thank you very very much Robin absolute and, pleasure um, doing